Good morning. Can I remind members of the COVID-related measures that are in place and that face coverings should be worn when moving around the Chamber and across the Holyrood campus? The first item of business is general questions. In order to get in as many people as possible, I'd appreciate short and succinct questions and answers. And at question number one, I call David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the next steps in collating Scotland census data. Cabinet Secretary Angus Robertson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. At Scotland Census Day was Sunday, the 20th of March, and I'm pleased to say that census returns are currently in line with our expected targets. I'd like to thank everyone who's so far taken the time to participate. The aim of the census is to deliver a set of questions and associated guidance that enables all of Scotland's people to access, to understand, and to complete the census. Every household in Scotland has a legal obligation to complete a census return. And the National Registers of Scotland have ensured that people are able to access a range of help and support to help them do so. David Torrance. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Although Census Day was on Sunday, would the Cabinet Secretary like to take this opportunity to highlight the importance of completing the Census? And can the Cabinet Secretary outline what scope there is for those who have not responded yet to send back returns now that Census Day has passed? Cabinet Secretary. At Scotland Census 2022 is the official count of every person and household in the country and the only questionnaire of its kind to ask everybody the same questions at the same time. And we've relied on this information uh, from censuses for, for more than 200 years. It remains the best way to gather vital information uh, for government councils, the NHS and a range of users in the public, private and third sectors. There's still time to submit. And while Census Day was last Sunday, the National Register of Scotland are still accepting submissions, reports available to all households to help complete their census uh, online or via a free helpline. Uh, for those who would need the number, it's 0800 030 8308. Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Cabinet Secretary, there were difficulties across my region with individuals who were struggling to get paper copies. Can I ask what uh, assessment has been done to ensure that they did receive uh, their paper copies on time? And if they haven't, uh, what outcomes are, are expected from that? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the feedback I've had from the, the work of the contact centre, which is where people call to secure a written census questionnaire, uh, has been working well, as with any large-scale operations, more than 1.2 million households in Scotland, there will be always uh, cases of uh, administrative shortcomings. If the member would like to forward me any specific details on the cases uh, that have been raised, I'd be happy to look at those. What has been reported to me is both the uh, efficient working of the contact centre, obviously a large number of calls at the beginnings of the census operations, but since there, waiting times have reduced uh, significantly, and people who require paper copies of the questionnaire have been receiving them. Christine Graham. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, on census data, constituents have contacted me unsure what is meant by Scots on the question of how and when they use Scots. Now, the corporate body includes Doric, Lallans, also Glaswegian, Shetland, Orcadian, and so on. Does the, does the Cabinet Secretary share my concerns that data may not be accurate, as people believe wrongly they do not actually use Scots? Cabinet Secretary. Can I say to uh, Christine Graham and to any member uh, in the Chamber that if they have constituents who are uncertain about any of the questions that are being posed to them, please could they draw their attention to the fact that there is very extensive guidance on the website of Scotland Census, and there is also a free phone helpline the number I've given already, 0800 030 8308. So if people have questions about this uh, or anything else, please would they raise them directly uh, and receive the guidance that they will require to help them answer uh, the census um, uh, 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 to their satisfaction. Question number two, John Mason. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what action it can take to demonstrate the viability of apprentice programmes as an alternative to university education in light of a Newcastle report published in 2021, reportedly showing that young people are advised against apprenticeships. Minister Jamie Hepburn. In Scotland, we have committed to maximising apprenticeship opportunities as a key way for employers to invest in their workforce, providing the skills the economy needs now and in the future. We recognise that apprenticeships are demand-led, and it is critical that we promote the benefits of undertaking apprenticeships as a key way 
for individuals to learn while they earn, and for employers to ensure their workforce has the skills needed now and into the future. Skills Development Scotland's all-age career service and our developing young workforce school coordinators, as well as events like Scottish Apprenticeship Week, are ensuring young people are aware of all the options they have and are supported to make an informed choice about their post-school destination. John Mason. I yeah, thank the Minister for that answer. I just wonder if he would accept that some schools appear to overemphasize university. And while university is a tremendous achievement for many young people, for others, apprenticeships are the right way forward. Minister. It will fundamentally the answer is yes. I would refer back to Mr Mason's question, though, in terms of the concerns arising out of the UCAS uh, reports. I would say those reports did not actually cover uh, the perspective, the position here uh, in Scotland. Uh, I perceive there to be uh, a change in schools. I think schools are doing more to promote apprenticeships as a, a good uh, destination for young people. But, of course, we need to continue to do more in that regard and uh, through the array, array of activity we are undertaking through developing young workforce, we will continue to promote apprenticeships as a very good option for all young people. Pam Gossel. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Meeting with apprenticeship providers, I have heard that SMEs need to be upskilling, but for micro SMEs, accessing the funding available can be difficult. They do not have the time or resources to look at funding or complete applications, and the red tape is resulting in fewer people being taken on. What action will the Scottish Government take to simplify the process to take on apprentices or upskill current staff? Minister. Yeah, well, in, in terms of the suggestion that uh, fewer apprentices have been taken on, that is not the case. We see the last set of statistics show that there are 1.8 times the number of ME starts at the same time uh, last uh, year, nearly twice the number. So I think it is important we place that on the record. But I, I do recognise it is incumbent on us to hear that feedback. My clear position, I have discussed this with Skills Development Scotland before, is that they continuously look at the process for applying for support and where improvements are needed. That is what I expect them to undertake. Stephanie Callaghan. Thank you, President Officer. Um, I appreciate the, the Minister's answer so far. Can you comment more widely on any Scottish Government plans to strengthen the partnership working between secondary schools, businesses and colleges, particularly on trade apprenticeships, to ensure that young people are getting a chance to get a taster of this and make fully informed career choices? Can the Minister comment widely and briefly? Thank you. Uh, well, I, I will certainly do my uh, level best to square that circle, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, I uh, agree that there is a need to make sure that we improve the experience of young people in relation to work-based learning. Fundamentally, that is what our Developing Young Workforce uh, initiative is all about. It is making progress, and it will continue to do that. Thank you. Question number three, Colin Smith. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of the current levels of unmet need and staff vacancies in social care. Minister Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The Scottish Government is aware that there are significant pressures facing the social care sector at present, including high levels of unmet need, and the situation is under constant review. Uh, we recognise that levels of unavailable, unavailable staff due to absence and vacancies are key challenges in addressing unmet need. The cross-sectoral adult social care gold group meets fortnightly, providing strategic national oversight on system pressures and resilience alongside key partners. The Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care and I have recently restarted fortnightly meetings with reps from local areas facing the most acute social care pressures with discussion focused on reducing system pressures. A series of lessons learned events are being planned with health and social care partnerships to explore learning and sharing of best practice in responding to recent system pressures, with the first event scheduled on 25 March 2022. And in October of last year, in response to the anticipated please conclude, system Minister? pressures, the Scottish Government announced £300 million in winter pressures funding to increase social care capacity. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. The Minister didn't actually say what the, the current assessed level of vacancies is, but I can tell him in Dumfries and Galloway there are over 100 vacancies, 3,000 hours of unmet need at the moment, and that's causing significant levels of delayed discharge. Surely the Minister will accept that several months after the Government announced what level of pay there was going to be for carers, it's clearly not working to fill these vacancies. And unless, and unless the government increase that pay rise, then we are going to continue to have this crisis of unmet need and a huge level of vacancies. 
Minister. Um, President officer, we are well aware of uh, vacancies and uh, uh, we have done a lot to ensure that we get more folk into social care and retain staff uh, that we have. And over the piece in terms of health and social care, we have uh, got an, a thousand additional folk um, in post uh, in recent times. Um, the Scottish Government are fully committed uh, to the principles of fair work and that is why we announced uh, the two recent pay rises that we did. Uh, and we pay more here than in Wales, which is Labour run, and uh, south of the border too. We know there is more to do. That is why we are committed to national pay bargaining in our national care service proposals. Uh, but we will do more before then in partnership with COSLA and others. Thank you. Question number four, Colin Beattie. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the consultation on a draft national plan to end the need for food banks. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robertson. Uh, no one should have to rely on charitable food provision, which is why we are developing a national plan to end the need for food banks. There have been over 400 responses to our consultation, and they will now be independently analysed and inform our final national plan. My aim is that this plan will further progress our human rights approach and strengthen our cash-first response. There are early indications that this approach is making a difference, with the Trussell Trust reporting a marked reduction in the number of emergency food bank parcels in Scotland between April and September 2021, compared to 2019. Colin Beatty. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response. I welcome the announcement from the Scottish Government that they plan to increase eight Scottish Social Security benefits by 6 per cent from 1 April. I hope this will help my support my constituents who have been impacted by UK Government welfare cuts. Does the Cabinet Secretary, however, share my concerns about the growing demand for food banks and the impact UK Government welfare cuts have had on the most vulnerable in our society? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I do, and that is why I am committed to publishing a plan that will use the powers we have to make food banks the last port of call. And We have been doing all we can to mitigate the impact, and last year invested over £2.5 billion to support low-income households. But we do that with one hand tied. The member referred to benefit cuts, and we know, of course, the devastating cut to universal credit was the biggest overnight cut to benefits since the welfare state was established. And yesterday's statement from the Chancellor was a missed opportunity that completely fail to help those in need, as evidenced by the devastating analysis carried out by the Resolution Foundation and the Joseph Rentree Foundation. Question number five, Liam McCarthy. Thank you to ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the UK Government regarding matching Ukrainian refugees with households in Scotland that have registered under the Homes for Ukraine scheme. Minister Neil Gray. Thank you, President Officer. We continue to work closely with uh, the UK Government on the design and operation of the Homes for Ukraine scheme. We are focused on ensuring a smooth and early flow of data to support the operation of the Scottish Government's Super Sponsors uh, programme uh, and meet our objectives for a warm and well delivered welcome for all those who arrive in Scotland. And I met with uh, Lord Richard Harrington to emphasise that need just yesterday. Liam MacArthur. Uh, can I thank the Minister for that response and also for his engagement on some of the issues that have, raised, uh, uh, have arisen at a local level in Orkney over uh, recent weeks? But while 150,000, uh, myself included, have signed up to the Homes for Ukraine scheme, so far only around uh, 12,000 Ukrainian refugees have been given permission to come to the UK. As the barbaric shelling of cities like Mariupol continues, an estimated 10 million Ukrainians have already fled their homes. So can the Minister confirm when he expects the matching of refugees to individual households in Scotland to begin? And can he also say what further support is being provided to local councils to ensure they can meet the needs of those arriving from Ukraine? Minister. I thank Liam McCarr for that question. Obviously, we are still reliant on uh, the UK Government's immigration system to uh, work at pace to get through the visa uh, applications and to ensure that that data then comes to the Scottish Government. Um, we are maintaining the pressure on the UK Government to ensure that that happens at pace, given everything that he has said in terms of the situation on the ground. In terms of support for local authorities, we have provided over £13 million of uh, support that is going to be distributed to local authorities to acknowledge uh, the work that is going to be required from them, and that is over and above uh, the £10,500 uh, commitment to uh, local authorities that will be coming uh, from the UK Government uh, per person arriving from Ukraine. Question number six, Liam Kerr. You ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on what assessment it has made of GP numbers and surgery provision in the North East. Cabinet Secretary Hamza Youssef. And health and social care partnerships are responsible for assessing the needs of their patients and ensuring that GPs are contracted or otherwise engaged to meet those needs. The Scottish Government funds GP practices in the North East and elsewhere, of course, based on their estimated share of overall national workload. 
William Kerr. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. But look, last week the people of Aberdeen learned that the Great Western Doctor Surgery, with 10,000 patients, might have to take drastic measures due to a lack of GPs in the North East. Now, when I asked about similar situations at Cardin, I got weasel words and fudge. Combined with Great Western, there could be 18,500 patients affected here. So, Cabinet Secretary, the people of the North East don't want your standard pivot to what's happening in England or how many GPs there are in the central belt. They want a clear answer. What is he doing to increase the number of GPs in Aberdeen and the North East? And in what year does he project that there will be enough? There is a lot uh, happening in uh, Scotland and, and particularly in the North East. For example, we have the Rediscover the Joy programme, which has been piloted in four uh, uh, rural health boards in the north of Scotland. It's been expanded actually also uh, to Tayside as well. On top of that, of course, we have the Golden Hello scheme where there are shortages uh, of GPs. And he says he doesn't want me uh, to pivot, but of course he can't hide away from the fact that this government has a commitment to increase GP numbers, GP numbers uh, by 2027 by 800. And we're four years into that commitment and we've increased GP numbers by over 250. On top of that, of course, in Scotland we do have more GPs. You might not want to hear it, but we do have more GPs than the rest of the UK. Uh, in Scotland we have, uh, he might not want to hear it, uh, Planning Officer, but he should listen, that in Scotland we have 94 GPs per 100,000, where his party is in charge in England, of course, that number is 76 per 100,000. Brief supplementary, Mercedes Vialba. Thank you. One of the key reasons used to justify the tendering of Old Aberdeen medical practice was to improve the sustainability of GP services in the city. Yet many of the city's practices are now facing closure and unsustainable GP to patient ratios, um, which poses a threat to patient care. Last time I asked the Cabinet Secretary to meet with those affected, he said he would consider it, but when I followed up with him, I was told he didn't have time. Three months have passed, so I'm asking the Cabinet Secretary again, will he meet with staff and patients to hear their concerns? Briefly, Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, I, of course I would consider meeting uh, uh, Mercedes Villas Alba. But what I would say is, of course, last time uh, she raised this issue with me, I did give her the details of the Health and Social Care Partnership where these issues are being taken forward. And actually, when I looked at the old Aberdeen medical practice, which was raised uh, a moment ago, my understanding, certainly from my conversations with uh, the board, are that more skills and more resources are now available to the practice. And that is, of course, good for uh, the patients of old Aberdeen medical practice. But of course, uh, given uh, the pressures uh, on my diary at that time, uh, I, I said to Mercedes Villas Alba, and I say again, uh, when, of course, the diary allows, I'd be more than happy to meet with her uh, and indeed to meet campaigners too. Thank you. Question number seven, Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government how it's making the streets safer for women and girls. Minister Ash Regan. The Scottish Government is taking a broad range of actions to ensure that women and girls uh, are and feel safe within our communities. We are improving our laws, we are investing in policing, and we have proposed new national planning policy embedding human rights and equality in decision making to deliver better places for everyone. And our public health approach to reducing violence, including the equally safe strategy, continues to have a decisive focus on preventing violence and tackling the underlying attitudes that perpetuate it. And our new two-year Delivering Equally Safe Fund will award £38 million to projects which focus on early intervention and prevention. Julian Martin. I thank the Minister for that answer. I am particularly interested to ask about the excellent Don't Be That Guy video campaign and how it has been rolled out to get to the target audience. I imagine, of young men. I would like to know future plans for any other campaigns and materials, and specifically how we are assisting those who work with our young people with materials that can help them tackle male behaviours that intimidate women and girls and ultimately put them at risk. Minister. So, Police Scotland recently launched the Don't Be That Guy public awareness campaign, um, asking men to challenge their own and, I think importantly, each other's behaviours and attitudes towards women. And I think this was an important message for Scottish society, including for policing as individuals and as a service. The campaign has generated a lot of interest. It seemed to be very well received, and it will be good in time to see its impact. Police Scotland have advised me that over 6 million people worldwide have seen the That Guy film and over 80,000 people have visited the website. And government organisations and police services across the UK and beyond 
are changing the focus of their public communication on sexual violence to align with the That Guy strategy. Uh, Police Scotland are developing a number of public campaigns for the forthcoming year, targeting men and under the That Guy banner related to different aspects of men's violence. Thank you. That concludes general questions. And before we move on to the next item of business, I invite members to join me in welcoming to the gallery Lisbeth Homans, Speaker of the Flemish Parliament. <laughs> 